Hello everyone, I am Dr. Lahari here from the Department of Oral Medicine and Radiology and uh, welcome to the very first lecture of year three on uh, for oral pathology and oral medicine. This is examination and diagnosis of the dental patient. Now this lecture is divided into two parts and uh, I have covered here part one of examination and diagnosis. The learning outcomes would be to understand the significance of obtaining the dental history, also how to take a detailed case history, to understand the significance of uh, medical history and significance of medical drug, past dental, family and uh, social history within that uh, within the uh, frame of uh, medical history as well as understanding the steps involved in examination of the oral cavity, diagnostic process and treatment planning. So basically the essential contents of examination and diagnosis. Now the learning outcomes for this topic are very similar to the ones in examination and diagnosis of family dentistry as well. So since uh, the, there is a common case history taken for any dental patient, I have tried to comprehensively cover it all in this topic. So I have used the sample of our own patient record as um, an example of how to take case history of a patient. So um, this is the first page of the patient record and I shall be using this throughout the, um, throughout the lecture to make you understand as to how dental case histories are taken. Right, so how do you begin? First of all, it's important to greet the patient and make them feel comfortable. Now, you must understand that dentistry as such and dental profession as such sometimes um, involves, uh, you know, uh, th there's certain fear or uh, the fear of pain that the patient has when they walk into a dental clinic. And many a times it is the first time that the dentist, the patient is actually walking into the clinic after a very long uh, gap or uh, in general, in uh, middle and upper middle income countries, the experience of a patient at the dentist probably is not very, um, you know, not very regular. So that's why it's important to make your patient feel comfortable so that they open up and tell you what exactly their problem is. When the patient is on your dental chair, please make them sit upright so you are looking at them and address them by their name or a salutation if they have any and introduce yourself. Then you could have an opening question like, how are you? How can I help you to make them feel comfortable? Following that, let the patient talk first. The patient will tend to open up and tell you why they are here. And when the patient is talking, don't interrupt the patient so, so that their opening statements are clear and they are not influenced by what you are asking them. After that, they're on, build a rapport. And from the beginning, maintain this rapport so that the patient feels um, uh, taken care of. We start off with the demographic data of the patient. And generally, in most uh, dental clinics or dental institutions, this demographic data is already filled at the reception uh, before your patient is actually seated on your chair. So essentially, the demographic data of any patient contains the name, the registration number, um, the age and gender of the patient, as well as the date that you are uh, seeing the case, as well as some information like uh, contact number and uh, identity number, uh, nationality, and an emergency contact number, just in case you know there is um, <clears throat> emergency with the patient and you need to contact the next of kin. Now, along with all of these, we tend to ask the occupation and the address of the patient. Now, why are these details important? It's very natural that you need to know and identify the person by his or her name, the age and gender. And uh, it's important to understand the occupation of the patient because it gives you an idea of the patient's um, level of awareness, his or her uh, level of or their uh, level of um, understanding and of dental uh, requirements and uh, also their needs. So also there are certain dental diseases which could be more commonly associated with a few occupations. For example, these days you would or uh, see more of temporomandibular disorders or uh, uh, patients coming to you with uh, um, attrition and clenching habits 
in uh, patients who are um, by profession in, in a very stressful lifestyle or, or having a stressful profession or people who work uh, late night and night shifts and have lack of sleep. Right. So uh, along with that, you could have people who are working in industries which have, uh, um, you know, some amount of chemical exposure or, um, you know, <clears throat> acidic exposure because of which there could be uh, effects seen on the dentition. The address of a patient is also important, which gives you idea of the social background of the patient, as well as there could be certain diseases which could be endemic to that area or certain dental conditions like fluorosis, which could be endemic to the area where the patient belongs to. I wouldn't say endemic with fluorosis, but probably more common in those areas. Now, generally the address of a patient keeps changing, so you might want to update this information as and when the patient alerts you. So that's about the demographic data of the patient. Now, again, this is just an example. You could have various other information involved in this, but this is something which is basic and important for you to note down. Moving on is one of the most important component of the case file or the patient record is the informed consent. Now, informed consent, um, consent taking for a patient could be both verbal or written um, or even digital these days. But written consent is the most acceptable and um, most uh, um, <clears throat> useful form of consent where the person is declaring himself or themselves or herself that he, she or they have some condition which um, is something which they know of and they are informing the doctor of. For example, the informed consent uh, in our patient record uh, has questions like these. Are you hypertensive? Yes, no. Are you diabetic? Yes, no. Now, when you're talking about yes, no, there is no um, option for I don't know. So probably some of the patients, you might be the first one to actually diagnose that they could be hypertensive or diabetic. So that's the important, that's why it's very important to uh, get a proper consent from the patient. Uh, next question is, do you have any infectious or contagious diseases? Now, in this day and era of the pandemic, it is again, this, this question would have been probably addressed um, and it becomes all the more important that it is addressed at the very beginning uh, because even before you take a consent, the patient would have already signed a declaration regarding his or her status of uh, um, infection. So when we're talking about infectious or contagious diseases, we're not only talking about uh, um, highly infectious ones like COVID or uh, influenza, the common uh, cold, or even uh, other viral infections like uh, chickenpox, for example, or if the patient is having more serious infections like hepatitis B or HIV, which are of um, severe or, or important implication in a dental setting. Followed by, you are asking the question if he or she or they know of any allergic conditions. Now, generally, um, patients may have difficulty in understanding the difference between what is allergy versus what is an adverse drug reaction. Now, allergies generally manifest as um, an anaphylactic reaction. They are generally immediate or a patient could have developed uh, redness, swelling, or difficulty in breathing, or difficulty in swallowing as a result of allergy. So that is something which would definitely be, um, the patient would definitely remember. And in generally, uh, the patient would carry a card, an emergency card, with the medication that they are allergic to. Now, on the other hand, adverse drug reactions um, do not manifest this way. They could manifest as gastritis or in the form of vomiting and diarrhea and are more common and could occur to happen to a variety or, or a, a vast majority of the patients who have uh, issues with a certain, some, certain amount of certain drugs, for example, um, unable to tolerate NSAIDs and developing gastritis to it. Whereas allergy is very specific and um, a patient generally will always be allergic to that medication each time that he or she takes it. So it's very important to understand the difference, make the patient understand the difference and note down if the patient has is allergy to any particular medication. Especially uh, of importance in dentistry is uh, allergy to 
um, antibiotics uh, like penicillin or allergy to local anesthesia which is quite rare but is important to note down or allergy to any uh, particular contents within the local anesthesia or even allergy to latex for that matter right so um, the next question would be have you undergone any surgery recently now this is just to make the patient understand that if there is a major surgical history it's important that the dentist should know now when we're talking about recently here we means in the recent we mean the recent past now if the patient has had a heart surgery surgery for the brain or may any important vital organ even in uh, in the last 10 years or 20 years it's very important that you know of it because the patient would still be on medication for that particular um, surgery but if the patient has had surgery for um, a fractured arm uh, like 10 years ago and it is now healed and it's absolutely fine, then probably the relevance of that history is not much. So I hope you understand this. So at the same time, it's important to ask if they've had any surgery in the dental region, in the maxillofacial region, which is again very critical if they've had extractions of third molars, surgical removal of third molars, if they've had... Um, any other facial surgery done, orthognathic surgery done, it's important that you need know. This also gives you an idea that the patient uh, has tolerated the surgery well or has not tolerated the surgery well. What have the side effects been of after the surgery? And is the patient still on medication? So all of that details you can ask later on in the medical history. Right. <clears throat> Next question is, do you have any habits that may cause harm to your health? Now, it's again a very um, clear statement. When we're talking about habits causing harm, we are clearly referring to um, deleterious habits. Habits like smoking, um, having alcohol. Now, how is it important that you know these? Is because we very clearly know that smoking is associated, tobacco usage is associated or, uh, with oral cancer, as well as it can cause heavy staining of teeth. So when we're talking about habits, we could take the details of that further in, in uh, later on in the history. But it's important uh, to that you get the um, get the information out from the patient regarding the usage of the type of uh, product that they are using, the tobacco or the uh, substance that they are using, as well as the uh, frequency of usage and the duration. How long have they been using it? Later on, the, the question would be, <clears throat> next is, are you on medication for any illness? Now, obviously, if the patient tells you that he or she or they have had hypertension or, or, or they are diabetic, then definitely there is a list of medication that you might need to note down. But sometimes the informed consent doesn't cover all of this and they may be on other medication which is not part of this consent. So it's important that you note down what their routine medication is. And again, there is space to note that down in the medical history, but it's important to understand whether they are on any other medication. Now, why do we need to know if the patient is taking medication, let's say for um, a kidney disorder or for a condition, um, you know, a gastritis, is because these medications could interact with the ones that you are prescribing the patient for the dental condition or they could have um, a certain uh, side effects which may manifest in the oral cavity or you might want to adjust the medication with the uh, consent of the physician um, to suit the uh, dental uh, treatment needs of the patient. So that's why it's important that medication which the patient is taking is known to you. Now many a times the patient a regular patient is not aware of the names of the medicines that they are taking, which is, um, yes, very difficult for them to remember. Some patients carry medical cards with them, which has a list of all the medicines that they are taking, and that's very useful. And some patients just remember that, oh, I'm on medication for uh, diabetes, but I just don't know what they are. But that much I can tell you that it's a, it's a pill and it's not an injection. So that is really useful information because it gives you an idea that the patient is actually on oral hypoglycemics and not on insulin. So that's why uh, this informed consent, this question on medication is very important. Now, especially in an Asian context, it's important to ask the patient if they are on any supplements and herbal medication, alternative medicine as well. So all of these could also have a bearing on the dental treatment. And hence, it's important to know if the patient is on alternative medical treatment as well, like homeopathy or Chinese herbal medication. Um, Ayurvedic medication, etc. Lastly, the question is for women. 
and uh, if they are in the reproductive age age group you might want to ask them a question if they are pregnant at the moment so it's again important that the patient declares pregnancy because you wouldn't want to expose the patient to unnecessary radiation and you would take extra precaution when prescribing certain medication and also when planning the treatment for this patient. The end of the informed consent ends with an important statement where the patient is accepting or understanding what you have, um, what you are planning to do. They um, are aware of the benefits and the risks of the dental treatment are giving you the consent to carry on and perform your responsibilities. Now this informed consent could be uh, signed by, it should and must be signed by the patient himself or herself or themselves. Um, in case your patient is less than 18 years of age, which is the legal age for, uh, um, uh, for, for legal uh, reasons, then it's important that the parent or the guardian should accompany the patient and sign the consent for the patient. So generally, anyone who is below 18 years of age, the consent, their signature doesn't hold bearing for the consent. It is important that an adult uh, who is above the age of 18, who is related to the patient or who is a guardian for the patient, who's come along as a guardian, signs the informed consent. Now, you may have occasions where you have uh, youngsters walking to the dental clinic, just friends who are, um, you know, not yet 18 and would want to get cleaning done. Oh, yes, this does happen. And uh, in that sort of a situation is very difficult that who would give consent. It is best that uh, the parent or the guardian is informed and consent is taken from the appropriate person. The next sign is that of a witness. Now, it's important that whenever dental examination is done in the dental cubicle, the, apart from the patient and the operator or the dentist, um, there is another witness. So since we are practicing four-handed dentistry, the uh, witness is the second or the <clears throat> assistant who is along with you in the cubicle. Now, it's very important, again, that the consent is signed in front of a witness and the role of a witness is um, important because he or she or they uh, are a witness to the consent that the patient has provided. Lastly is the date. Uh, the date is also very important uh, when the consent was given and uh, sometimes a time is also noted down. Right. So this is the uh, page two of our case record, uh, patient record. Uh, like I told you earlier, it need not be exactly like this, but I am using our own patient record as an example to make you understand how a simple case file or a patient record should look like. All right. So it starts off with the chief complaint of the patient. Now, this is a very important statement and it should or must be written in the patient's own words. Now, when we mean patient's own words, it means what they actually want or what is their complaint. Here are a few examples of how patient's chief complaint can be translated and written down in uh, to sound like it's their own words. For example, patient complains of pain in the lower left back tooth region since three days. So that is a more appropriate way of writing the chief complaint down rather than using uh, medical or dental jargon like patient complains of pain in the 4-6 or the 3-6, which is not what the patient actually said. Nextly, other examples like patient complains of difficulty in chewing on the right side due to missing teeth since 4 months. Patient complains of stained teeth and wants cleaning done. Patient complains of crooked teeth and requests for braces to be done. So if you've noticed in all of these chief complaint statements, they've been written in simplified layman terms and do not contain any dental jargon. So that's how chief complaint should be written. Next is the most important aspect of the case history or the uh, patient record. In my, in my opinion, this is the most important part, which is the history of presenting illness. History of presenting illness describes the chief complaint in detail. Now, I am using the example of patient with pain to explain you how the HOPI must be written. 
So for ease of understanding or for remembering the sequence of the questions that you might ask your patient, you could use the mnemonic, which is old cards or Socrates. Now, these are mnemonics which have been used in the uh, medical and the dental field from a very long time. And they are uh, time tested and um, easy to remember and uh, help you with uh, noting the history without missing a point. So old cards translates to onset, location, duration, character, which is severity, type and nature of pain, aggravating factors, relieving factors, treatment received and lastly swelling history. Now this is very relevant to dental uh, HOPI for pain. Similarly, you could also use Socrates for sight, onset, character, radiation, associated symptoms like swelling, timing or duration, exacerbating or relieving factors and severity. Now, this is an example of HOPI of dental pain. Patient comes with a chief complaint of um, complaint in of pain in the lower left back tooth region since three days. So, how do you go about this chief complaint? Patient first noticed mild pain in the lower left back tooth region of the jaw since one month ago. It was intermittent in nature and only occurred while having cold drinks. Since the past three days, the patient has noticed that the pain has become more severe, continuous and sharp. So that's describing your characteristics of the pain. Currently, the visual analog score is 9 over 10. The visual analog scale is a simplified version of describing how the pain is. So you give the example to the patient that if the, um, you have ever experienced the most severe pain that you have ever experienced is scored as, is scored as 10 and no pain is scored as 0, then what is your current pain scale on a score of 0 to 10? And then the patient will think and tell you that probably it's somewhere between 8 to 9, which gives you an idea that it's a severe pain. If the patient gives you a score 5, 6, you get an idea that it's moderate pain. And if the patient scores it just 1, 2 or 3, then you know that it is mild pain. There are other methods of scoring pain, but this is one of the most simplest, quickest and efficient method of um, <clears throat> quantifying pain. Next, patient also reports that pain radiates to the entire left side of the face. She has tried to use over-the-counter painkills, but they provided her only temporary relief in pain. She feels more discomfort at bedtime, that is when lying down. So this is an indication that the tooth is probably carious and involving the pulp, and that's why postural variation is causing her more discomfort and has had sleepless night last night. This morning she woke up feeling feverish but did not notice any swelling. So this way we've covered most of the aspects of the old cards right from onset, location, duration, character, aggravating, relieving factors and uh, swelling and if or she or he has received any treatment for this. So this is an example of HOPI of dental. Now, moving on, medical history. Now, when we're talking about medical history, there is a lot of information that you might want to know from the patient. But most importantly, what you would want to know is a review of systems. You would want to ask the patient if they've had a, they, they are aware of any medical conditions or if there's anything some, they would want to uh, bring the attention of the doctor to. But if they're already aware, for example, we took the example of diabetes. If they're already aware, then you would want to know the details of the medical condition. You would want to know the current medication and ongoing treatment. And how is the patient's medical condition going to impact the dental management of the patient? So using all of this information, you would be able to answer the last question. That how the patient's medical condition is going to impact the dental management of the patient. Right, so it's for ease of reviewing the systems, you could follow A to O of um, 
known medical conditions starting with allergies, bleeding disorders, cardiorespiratory disorders, drug treatment, endocrine disorders, fits or faints, gastrointestinal disorders, hospital admissions and attendances, infections, jaundice and liver disorders, kidney disorders, likelihood of pregnancy, the mental state of the patient, neurological problems and others. So this is a very comprehensive method of recording the medical history and uh, you're less likely to miss anything. Apart from this, if the patient is personally withholding information from you, it would be difficult to um, gain the medical history. But nevertheless, you could always pursue to take the medical history and per be persistent with the medical history of the patient on the next visit and you can always um, get more details and keep updating the uh, records of the patient. So it's important in the dental setting that medical history along with all the other um, <clears throat> aspects is updated every six months and um, every six months that the patient visits you. So this is an example of things that you note down in a medical history. I've used the example of diabetes again. First of all, um, when was it diagnosed and how long? What type of diabetes does the patient have? Does he hear, do, do they remember if it is um, type 1, type 2 or juvenile? Is the diabetes under control? How do you understand this? It's by asking them about their last readings. Uh, when was uh, fasting blood sugar done and what was the value? Did they do postprandial or have they got the HbA1c values and does it lie within the normal range? So when you're asking these questions, it's important that you have a sound knowledge or background of what the normal values are. You would also want to ask the patient about their current medication. Are they on oral hypoglycemics? If they are, for example, is it metformin? Um, are they taking 500 milligrams once daily or is it uh, any other medication? Patient cannot recall. If they do recall, please note down the name of the uh, medication. If the patient is on insulin, what type of insulin? How many units of insulin are they taking? What, at, at what time do they take um, uh, the insulin? This is an example of 20 units, 18 units, and 20 units again at bedtime. So that means 20 in the morning, 18 in the afternoon, and 20 at bedtime. Apart from this, you would also want to ask if they have any complications, any associated heart disorder or kidney condition um, that might influence your dental treatment. So... Blood glucose chart is something uh, which is generally available in the clinic. You can run through these uh, values in case you are having doubts. But it's important to remember these uh, normal values, um, generally noted in millimoles per liter. And uh, a value below 7 indicates um, a good control and a gen of fasting. And a value below 11 indicates a non-fasting good control uh, of blood sugar. Um, but of course, there are more details that you might want to remember depending on um, the range of uh, blood sugar levels of the patient and the values that is important is the uh, fasting postprandial as well as the HbA1c. Now, the HbA1c is glycosylated hemoglobin and is generally recorded once in three months and gives you an idea of whether the patient has been under control or no and a value of around 6.5 is considered good control below 6.5. So there could be other aspects of the medical history that is recorded for the patient. For example, if the patient has had cancer treatment done, then you would want to know very important aspects of the treatment, like what was the cancer, when was the treatment done, where was the treatment done, and which part of the body was involved, what type of cancer was it, how uh, did the patient get treatment done, I mean, uh, <clears throat> did was it only... Uh, surgical management, was there chemotherapy, radiotherapy, and when, how long back was it? And of course, why in the sense is, <clears throat> how is it that impacting your dental management? And uh, uh, if the patient has not got treatment done or has um, had interrupted treatment done or has not followed up, then you would not want to know why um, that this has happened. 
so th there are more aspects of medical history i have just given you two examples there is so much more to it and uh, i would believe that it's beyond the scope of this lecture to give you examples of each and every disease aspect but as and when you are in the clinic and you see more and more cases you will understand um, through observation and experience that uh, um, there are some very important aspects that you need to know down in the history of the patient that would directly or indirectly impact the dental treatment of the patient. Next we come to the dental history. In the dental history of the patient, um, like I told you, it, it is important to, for you to understand that we are um, the dental history of a patient who is in an urban setting versus that who that of that in a rural setting could be different and um, it, it, you and it's very important to understand what the patient's past dental experience has been um, he do they remember their dental uh, history was it only during school time or have they had recent dental history done recent dental history and uh, what was uh, the treatment done so this also gives you an idea if the patient has been on regular dental care or is only visiting when they have a uh, pain or do they only come to a dentist when they want to claim insurance um, so these are aspects of the dental history that have uh, um, you know can be varying in different patients and uh, you might want to note these important features down so um, again it gives you a very clear picture as to how compliant your patient is going to be to your dental treatment now when you're noting down the dental history of the patient and let us say the patient has for example had bitter experience or a bad experience with the previous dentist as a dental colleague it is important that you do not put down the other colleague even if you know or don't know who they are so generally um, it is important that you just make note of that comment that the patient is telling you that they have had a, a poor or a bad experience and you might want to do, um, you know, help the patient out by providing them a treatment which would address those con previous concerns. So, and that is the reason why you note down the dental history of the patient. Next is the personal history of the patient. Now, this is um, has can have various aspects to it. Uh, um, the most important ones would be what is the oral hygiene and the oral care regimen of the patient. This would involve frequency of brushing, cleaning aids used, and um, what is their routine. Because uh, oral care is something which we expect uh, patient, all patients, to maintain every single day and in fact in fact in fact twice a day that's what dentists encourage their patients to do so you would want to know if they are using fluoridated toothbrush toothpaste if they're using the right kind of tooth bristles or what is their uh, regimen like apart from that um, we also note down habits you've taken a note of the habits in the consent of the patient and um, you would want to note down details of those habits uh, in the personal history. Um, for example, is the patient smoking, drinking, using tobacco or some sort of substance abuse or a combination of all of these and the frequency type and duration. Now, <clears throat> many a times the patient is hesitant and uh, doesn't want to give you the entire details. But whatever details you can get from the patient, it's important to note down. An example would be patient is a chronic smoker. He smokes 10 sticks of cigarettes per day for the last 10 years. So that gives you information about uh, the usage of uh, tobacco and what form of tobacco and duration that <clears throat> it's been used. So uh, this is again a very uh, important uh, question because many a times the patient is uh, suddenly you would notice when you're talking to the patient that there's a change in body language. They don't want to tell you and or they feel guilty uh, to admit that they have been smoking or um, you know using the substance. So um, you can expect that patient doesn't give you the entire details. Uh, at this, in this um, area but um, it is important that you're persistent and record the details of the history um, because it's important for you to know to modify your 
treatment plan accordingly. And you must also remember that as a medical or a healthcare professional, you do have the responsibility to educate your patient regarding the, uh, these habits and that they cause harm to the health of the patient. Now, in the dental setting, other than deleterious habits, you also have parafunctional habits. Now, these are habits like thumb sucking, nail biting, biting on eyes, sucking on lemon. All of these, again, have direct effects on the dentition. So, you could have malocclusion, attrition, or uh, abrasion, or other uh, uh, effects on the teeth, and which could be directly related to these parafunctional habits that the patient is uh, having. Family history and social history. Now, um, not every patient's history might contribute to this area of the patient record, but generally when you're recording family history, it's important to note down if there are certain diseases running in the family. And um, for example, if you're talking about hemophilia or susceptibility to early diabetes, for example, are uh, examples of family history that might be of importance. Uh, in social history, you would uh, like to know what the living condition of the patient is, a lifestyle, or if they're belonging to any um, community or a group of people like refugees or marginalized pe um, people like, uh, um, or uh, using substances. So this gives you an idea that the social of the social history of the patient, and again, will help you directly or indirectly to manage the treatment plan of the patient based on their social background. <clears throat> We've come to the uh, examination part of the um, patient record. Um, we've already covered the entire history part of it. Uh, now we're going to discuss the examination part of it. So the examination is generally divided into general physical examination, extra oral examination, and intra oral examination. Dental setting, the general physical examination can be um, not very much in detail, but if there is a specific um, physical condition that you noticed in the patient, um, it is important to note down and it might directly have an effect on your dental management of the case. The extraoral examination, the common things that you note would be facial symmetry. Uh, regarding the TMJ and the lymph nodes. Now let's look at three of these in detail. Firstly, facial symmetry. Now, all human beings, none of us have symmetrical right and left side of the face. Uh, and if there is an absolute asymmetry, it is something which you would definitely notice. I have used the example of a swelling to describe what asymmetry in the facial region could look like. Now, when you're looking at a patient who has an obvious swelling and the patient has come to you for the management of the swelling or has not come to you for the management and it is an incidental finding, there are certain things that you note down in the examination. Uh, <clears throat> you would divide, divide the extra oral examination into inspection and palpation. The inspection would be would include site or location of the swelling. In this case, it is the right side of the patient's face, uh, entire lower half and middle half of the face, the size of the swelling. Now, when we're describing size of the swelling, we would want to use uh, size in two dimensions, uh, which is the um, width of the swelling and the length of the swelling, or in anterior posterior extent of the swelling and superior inferior extent of the swelling. For example, relative to the size of the picture that I have shown you here, this swelling is probably 5 times 6 cm in size or maybe even 7 cm in size, right? So the superior inferior extent of the swelling is right from the um, uh, lower lid of the eye to about 2 cm below the lower border of the mandible. And the anterior posterior extent of the swelling is right from the corner of the mouth to probably um, close to 2 cm in front of the ala or, or the tragus of the ear. So that gives you an idea that it's quite a big swelling and the extent of the swelling has to be written down in detail. Next is the surface of the swelling. The surface includes texture, color changes, any sinus openings, scarring, bruising, etc. For example, this case you would notice as the surface looks absolutely normal, it's just a little stretched 
and there is no change in color of the skin. Next is the borders of the swelling. This is a diffuse swelling. You could have very well demarcated swellings as well. In this swell, in this case, the borders of the swelling are merging with normal uh, skin and it doesn't let you understand where exactly the swelling ends uh, and you can only give a rough idea and hence it's a diffuse swelling. Next, you will also like to add a note on the effect on the surrounding structures. In this case, you note definitely that there, the eye is involved and the picture lets you understand that there's definite involvement of the corner of the nose as well as the angle of the mouth. Uh, next, we come to palpation. Um, when you are palpating the case, uh, it's important that you wear gloves on and uh, <clears throat> the important points that you note down as soon as you place your fingers to palpate the skin would be firstly local rise in temperature. So inflammatory swellings are generally warm and because of um, inflammatory process happening in the swelling and it, you would be easily able to tell the difference between the swelling the right side of the cheek versus the left side based on the rise in temperature. The next thing that you immediately notice would be tenderness. Is the pain, is the area tender or not? Now, I would like to bring to your attention here that there's a difference between tenderness and pain. Pain is something which the patient tells you. It is a symptom, whereas tenderness is a sign. It is something which you have elicited. So if you have palpated the swelling and the patient tells you that, yes, it's painful, it means that it is ten tender. But if the patient himself or herself tells you that I have a painful swelling, it is a symptom. Right. Next is consistency. So in any swelling, um, it is important to understand the consistency. Now, consistency is how the swelling feels like. It can be divided into soft, firm or hard. Now, if you were to understand in a human body what is soft, firm or hard, it would mean that soft is probably the cheek of the patient. Firm is probably when you're palpating muzzle and hard is when you're uh, similar to when you're palpating bone. Now, you could also have soft to firm and firm to hard swellings as well. It's another important thing that you need to understand is the swelling need not be uniform in consistency. You could have a central soft area and a firm periphery. So those details have to be noted down. Next is confirming the borders of the swelling. Now, when you have inspected, it looks like a diffuse swelling and you are only able to tell roughly as to what the extent of the swelling is. But when you palpate, you can exactly tell how, uh, how what is the extent of the swelling. Uh, you can also confirm the effects on surrounding structures if any particular area is involved and uh, how um, the depth of the swelling uh, can also be assessed based on palpation of the swelling. Next is TMJ examination. Now, TMJ examination, again, is something which I would want to personally teach you in the clinics, but I could use these examples to uh, pictures to tell you how it should be done. Preferably, you're standing behind the patient and examining the TMJ by palpation. And when you stand in front of the patient to assess the mouth opening of the patient. So I have provided here certain links for you to um, understand better what or how to do TMJ examination. So to understand a TMJ examination, again, I've divided it into inspection and palpation. When you're inspecting the TMJ, it's important to start with the skin over the TMJ area in front of the tragus of the ear. You're looking for erythema or any swelling. You're also going to assess the mouth opening of the patient, whether it is normal or restricted. Now, how do we know whether it's normal or restricted? Now, in an ideal condition, it's important to assess the maximum mouth opening of the patient by measuring the interincisal distance, which is shown here in figure E. Now, interincisal distance is the distance between the upper central incisor and the corresponding lower central incisor. Generally, the mouth opening in males would be around 50 to 55 mm and the maximum mouth opening in females would be 40 to 45 mm. But you could have variations between that. Um, the other way of assessing uh, mouth opening is asking the patient to himself or herself or themselves put their fingers into the oral cavity. 
vertically and see how much mouth opening is there so a finger width opening of about three finger width uh, is considered normal anything below that is considered uh, restricted mouth opening also it's important to notice the pattern of mouth opening for example in picture c you can notice that the patient is having a deviated path of opening and uh, the jaw is deviating to the left side clearly when the patient is opening. Normally, all patients have a, a S-shaped curve opening. That means when you open this slight deviation and when you close back, you go back in the same path. But obvious deviations or shift in the midline has to be noted down. Also, is the patient having pain or while opening? Next, the um, lateral jaw movements. Uh, how much of movement is the patient able to perform while uh, he or she is opening and moving the jaw to the lateral um, lateral movements of the jaw and uh, also uh, protrusive movements. Is there any associated noise? Um, opening click or closing click or both? So click is the noise uh, that we generally associate with the internal derangement of the TMJ. And are you able to perceive any clicking noise? Next, when you palpate the patient, um, you would use your fingers to palpate the patient. That's what we're seeing in picture B uh, the low, at the lower uh, left bottom uh, of the slide is um, <clears throat> placing two fingers in front of the tragus exactly over the TMJ region and asking the patient to open the oral cavity. Um, when you are doing palpation, you would simultaneously assess tenderness if there is any presence of swelling over the TMJ area. It's important to assess the range of movements, opening, closing, as well as lateral jaw movements. Click is something which is not only heard, but is also felt. So when the patient is opening or closing, are you feeling a click? That means a noise in the TMJ when it moves over your pulp of your finger. And is there, a pain when the, is there a pain when the patient is opening or closing the jaw? Crepitus is something which is like um, walking over dry leaves. It's better um, assessed with auscultation and generally an indication of arthritis of the TM joint. Uh, <clears throat> figure A is showing you mastication of muscles, of mast uh, sorry, um, palpation of muscles of mastication. Now, this is again... Uh, a whole area which uh, will have to be assessed clinically and very difficult for me to ex explain to you on this lecture entirely and I would want you to go through the uh, video that I link that I have uh, posted along with this uh, lecture topic to understand the, um, the muscles of mastication palpation both extraordinarily and intraorally. Auscultation of the TMJ is reserved for severe cases where you want to use a stethoscope or uh, even ultrasound to assess the noises that are coming from the TMJ. And lastly, intraorally for all TMJ patients or cases, occlusion should be assessed to uh, understand the, its impact on TMJ pain. Now, this brings us to the last part of extraoral examination, which is lymph node examination. Now, I'm restricting myself to the head and neck area because that is what uh, is important for dental setting. Now, in the head and neck region, um, the lymph nodes, there are multiple head and neck lymph nodes, hundreds of them. But the most important ones are the superficial ones, which you can palpate are the uh, pre-auricular lymph node right in front of the ear, uh, the parotid lymph nodes, which are seeing the body of the parotid, tonsillar or jugulodigastric, a very important lymph node, submental lymph node right under the chin area, submandibular, again, very important lymph node, which drains all the, um, uh, generally most of the teeth drain into submandibular lymph node and the side of the nose, lower lip, gums of all teeth, right? Only the tip of the lower lip and tip of the tongue and the lower anteriors drain into the submental lymph node. Apart from this, you also have post-auricular, occipital, and the cervical lymph, chain of lymph nodes, which is a superficial cervical, deep cervical, posterior cervical, and the supraclavicular lymph nodes. Now, when you are palpating or examining the lymph nodes, it's important that you make the patient understand and take their permission before you place the hands on the neck and you're examining. And um, also examination of lymph node gives you um, a very important idea about the extent of inflammation. And if you're suspecting any other, uh, if you're suspecting metastasis, then it's important to understand that uh, the lymph nodes uh, are very important 
and uh, the, this is an illustration of the major neck lymph node levels with anatomical boundaries that are resected during the neck dissection. More of this will be covered when we come to the oral cancer chapter. So um, to examine uh, the head and neck lymph nodes, uh, uh, the examination is again divided into inspection and palpation. I have given you the link of a video which, uh, which is done by uh, some of my students which can make you understand what exactly do you note down and how do you examine the lymph nodes. So essentially it is very similar to noting down a swelling in the neck region or in the head and neck area. What you're trying to inspect would be the site or location of the lymph nodes, the number of lymph nodes present, size, the surface and uh, um, any color changes over the area of the lymph nodes, any sinus opening or scarring, and if you're able to uh, delineate the borders of the uh, lymph node swelling. For example, the picture here, which I've borrowed from the internet, shows you uh, a very clear uh, enlargement in the neck region, which could probably be a, a um, you know, the jugular lymph node. Now, how does the lymph node feel like when you're palpating uh, for the first time? It is important to understand that it would be something like the size of a jelly bean and the consistency of a jelly bean. And when you are palpating, the most important aspects that you would note down would be, uh, first of all, is there any local rise in temperature in the area? Is the lymph node tender? You would confirm the number of lymph nodes in the area and also consistency of the lymph node. Is it soft, firm or are they hard? Now, important to note down under the lymph nodes um, palpation is fixity. Is the lymph node uh, freely mobile or is it fixed to the underlying structures? Um, fixity is, is a sign of uh, chronicity of the lymph node and gives you an idea that it could probably matted or fixed, which is uh, indicative of a chronic disease or even malignancy. Consisting of the lymph node also soft ones are generally acute uh, in um, uh, nature, acute lymphadenitis. Firm ones indicate that they have been there for some time and indicates chronic lymphadenitis or lymphadenopathy and uh, hard lymph nodes are a sign of uh, um, malignancy. So this is, this is what is important to note down in lymph nodes, uh, more details in the um, video that has been uh, posted here. All right, so uh, this nearly brings me to the end of the first part of examination and diagnosis. I have covered introduction, uh, part of how to take a good history, and the tips would be to begin by asking open-ended questions and show that you're interested. Posture is very important. Good body language is very important. Lean forwards and talk to the patient and make eye contact. You're more likely to have your patient uh, confiding in you and uh, giving you a good history if you follow these instructions. Also take note of concerns and expectations of the patient and summarize the points frequently so that the patient understands that you have got a good grasp of uh, the history. Also don't miss crucial signs. Right, so thank you for listening to me. The next part would conclude the entire patient record and please do email me if you have uh, any doubts. Right, thank you for listening.